Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India A final way of looking at globalization is to view it as cultural imperialism, sometimes known as media imperialism. The cultural imperialism theory came in, uh, was uh, first uh, came into prominence in the 1960s and the cultural, uh, cultural imperialism is defined as the practice of promoting a more powerful culture at over a least known or desirable culture. And usually, it is usually the case that the former belongs to a larger economically or military powerful nation and the latter belongs to a smaller, less powerful one. Now, cultural imperialism can take the form of an active formal policy or a general attitude. A metaphor of colonialism is often employed when talking about cultural imperialism. The cultural products of the first world are believed to invade the third world and conquer local culture. Now, this was the bogey uh, of cultural, the, the, uh, the alien cultural invasion theory, which was doing the rounds when the Indian skies were privatized or even uh, when uh, globalization uh, was formally being discussed in within Indian media and Indian uh, intelligentsia. The fear of an alien cultural invasion uh, resurrected the 1960s cultural imperial imperialism theory. In the stronger variants of the term world domination in a cultural sense is the explicit goal of the nation states or corporations that export the culture. Now, the term is usually used in a pejorative sense, usually in conjunction with a call to reject foreign influence. So, it is always often cultural imperialism, though it is larger than just media imperialism is often in, uh, equated with media or cultural imperialism. Uh, if we look at Downing and Srebrenica's uh, Sreben, uh, understanding, uh, it uh, is predicated on the idea of imperialism, imperialism as the conquest and control of one country by a more powerful one. It is a more complex idea, but it, uh, just uh, for a working definition, let us accept this definition of imperialism as the conquest and control of one country by a more powerful one. And according to them, cultural imperialism signifies the dimensions of the process that go beyond economic exploitation or military force. So, it is just not just economic exploitation or military force. And when we look at the history of colonialism, one of the most important definitions of imperialism has been offered by Edward Said, who calls it the control over a distant territory by, uh, by a European nation, by a nation, a col col colonizing nation. And in the history of colonialism, in the form of imperialism in which the government of the colony is run indirectly directly by foreigners, the education and media systems of many third world countries have been set up as replicas of those in Britain, France or the United States and carry their values as we see in the case of India. Not only our education system, our media, but all uh, legal apparatuses, all state apparatuses have been modeled by um, along the lines of those in Europe, mainly in Britain. And finally, they say Western advertising has made further inroads as have architectural and fashion styles. Subtly more powerfully, the message has often been insinuated that Western cultures are superior to the cultures of the third world. 
and we found a more blatant form of this, a more cruel or brutal form of this in the civilizational mission which denied history, culture or uh, identity to, to the col col colonies of European empires during the colonial era. Now, um, Herbert Schiller uh, uh, seems to equate it with, uh, mean, seems to gesture to the world system theory of Wallerstein and extends the scope of the cultural imperialism idea when he says that the concept of cultural imperialism and he is speaking in the 70s today best describes the sum of the processes by which a society is brought into the modern world system and how its dominating stratum is attracted, pressured, forced and sometimes bribed into shaping social institutions to correspond to or even promote the values and structures of the dominating center of the system. So, there seems to be an implication of the cultural system within the economic system uh, in the modern world system and how its dominating stratum is attracted, pressured, forced and sometimes bribed uh, into shaping social systems, social institutions. So, societies uh, in which with weak, weak uh, states or less developed societies are made to conform not only to the cultural patterns, but uh, the, the, in the values and structures of the dominating center of the system, which include other systems, uh, not only the cultural, not only its culture. And of course, he places an importance on the media aspect of imperialism by showing how in the integration of less developed societies into the more dominant ones, the public media into the systems of the developing one, not just the cultural, uh, culture of developing uh, developed cultures, but also uh, but the entire uh, system of developed society, the public media are play a very significant role and are the foremost example of operating enterprises that are used in the penetrative process. So, when we talk about the penetration of, uh, of capitalist system or dominant western system into non-western systems or non-capitalist uh, non systems. We are talking about uh, the, we, we often use the metaphor of penetration and this penetration occurs largely through the media which are used in the penetrative process. For penetration on a significant scale, the media themselves must be captured by the dominating penetrating power. That is why the importance of the media to the dominant system be it the state or uh, political systems or elite groups, how the control of the media can help them penetrate, uh, can assist them and facilitate the penetrative process. So, the importance of media and the power of the media. And this according to Schiller uh, occurs through the commercialization of broadcasting. So, the anxieties and phobias related to broadcasting and the media voiced by the Frankfurt School here are very important because the media can often become the tool of these global systems, often dominant global systems to, uh, to control people all across the world, uh, particularly in the less developed world. Tom McPhail uh, engages entirely with the media aspect of uh, imperialism. Uh, one aspect of the media um, aspect of imperialism, which is which he calls electronic colonialism. And electronic colonialism is defined by him as the dependency relationship established by the importation of communication hardware, foreign product produced software, along with engineers, technicians, and related information protocols that vicariously establish a set of foreign norms, values and expectations, which in varying degrees may alter 
the domestic cultures and socialization processes. So, while we talk about uh, uh, we, we talk about digital democracy, open software and questions of uh, cyber democracy, the technological capabilities of media and the internet to be liberatory. In reality, uh, the, the control of communication hardware, uh, foreign produced software by dominant groups along with engineers, technicians and related information protocols uh, helps in the establishment of a set of foreign norms, values and expectations which may alter domestic cultures and socialization processes. So, uh, we can easily talk about how uh, domestic cultures say in India or the socialization processes have been altered by the, uh, by, by the kind of hardware, the software that we use in how the entire India has been Googleized or Facebookized uh, through, the, uh, through the control of these by dominant groups or dominant media within which are based in the core nations rather than in the, in the periphery or in the less developed parts of the world. So, that the media, media imperialism is more uh, extends further than just uh, controlling the capacity to disseminate or the ownership of electronic media or technologies. It is it's the indirect control of uh, through the use of these medias to control domestic cultures and local cultures and non-Western, largely non-Western cultures. So, for this reason, Sui Nam Lee, uh, she because Sui Nam Nam Lee defines communication imperialism as the process in which the ownership and control over the hardware and software of mass media as well as other major forms of communication in one country are singly or together subjugated to the domination of another country with deleter deleterious effects on indigenous values, norms and culture. So, this is another aspect of cultural imp uh, imperialism, which is, uh, which is ostensibly uh, imposed not by uh, promoting the culture and values of one culture over another, of, of dominant cultures over others, but through the control of media and electronic hardware and software of mass media. So, insidiously, subtly, this is how it has an effect on the indigenous values and cultures rather than directly through the imposition of alien, the so called alien cultures. Now, critiques of, critics of scholars who discuss cultural imperialism have a number of cult critiques. Cultural imperialism is a term that is only used in discussions where cultural relativism and constructivism are generally taken as true. One cannot critique promoting Western values if one believes that said values are absolutely correct. Similarly, one cannot argue that Western epistemology is unjustly promoted in non-Western societies if one believes that those epistemologies are absolutely correct. Therefore, those who disagree with cultural relativism and constructivism and or constructivism may critique the employment of the term cultural imperialism on those terms. And the most important a critique of cultural imperialism has come from John Tomlinson in his book, Cultural Imperialism, A Critical Introduction, which delves into the much debated media imperialism theory, summarizing his research on the third world's reception of American television shows, he challenges the cultural imperialism argument, conveying his doubts about the degree to which U.S. shows in developing nations actually carry U.S. values and improve the profits of US, U.S. companies. So, first of all, Tomlinson dispels the myth that cultural imperialism is something which emerges from the non-Western world. He defines culturalism, 
as a concern about globalization and a concern about neo globalization as neo imperialism a debate which emerged within the west a debate which is critical about the effects of globalization on the non western world so it's a critique of cultural imperialism from within now tomlinson sets out to dispel several fallacies about the cultural imperialism myth or theory. He suggests that cultural imperialism is growing in some respects, but local transformations and interpretations of imported media products propose that cultural di diversification is not an end in a global society. So, if we the most obvious example is uh, that of Indian television, the example of uh, say ta Star TV in India, which when Star TV came to India, uh, it brought uh, the its uh, programming consisted largely of American content, uh, which were really reruns of American soap operas and Santa, Bra Santa Barbara, the bold and the beautiful and the uh, the, the controversial Baywatch and initially uh, it excited a lot of interest within India, particularly among the Indian elite who saw themselves as becoming uh, uh, audience of American television programs and, en and enjoyed being part of that global media scape. But after the initial flirtation where, uh, where middle class uh, anglicized housewives would talk about characters in American soap operas. The, the, the interest in American soap operas waned uh, uh, and another player in Indian television namely Z TV entered at that point uh, which, which was already a com com uh, competitor to Star TV. Uh, it emerged as a major competitor by uh, using the format of uh, American television, but Indianizing the content. And uh, Star TV found itself losing its viewers to ZTV and that is when Star TV did an about turn and completely Indianized the, the content, uh, uh, so that the Indian soap operas, the Indian telenovelas, while using the uh, television, American television, the soap opera format are completely transformed into the extent uh, not only are the Indianizations of American soap operas, but uh, using the Latin American model, uh, they all the South American model, they also use to promote Indian, uh, indigenous Indian values. The second aspect, the second uh, fallacy that he dispels is that one of the fundamental conceptual mistakes of cultural imperialism is to take for granted that the distribution of cultural goods can be considered as cultural dominance. So, mere distribution of cultural goods in the eyes of Tom Tomlinson does not constitute cultural dominance just the availability, the choice of cultural goods which we have in India, we have more than 200, uh, uh, more than 300 or some places, 400 channels available to us. It does not and many of them uh, include uh, our uh, uh, American, British foreign channels and yet that does not mean that Indians have completely switched over or India has been invaded by American or Western culture, because just the availability or the possibility of disseminating cultural goods does not mean that people would adopt those or accept those. Now, he supports this argument by highly criticizing the content, the concept that Americanization is occurring through global overflow of American television products. Uh, he is very critical of that because he feels that Americanization does not happen only this is this was the phobia this was the bogey of Americanization which was raised in several parts of the uh, non-western world that 
uh, their cultures would be Americanized uh, through the private say through the privatization of the Indian skies and in when American programs began became available to Indian users, Indian viewers. But it isn't uh, uh, Americanization. It was supposed to lead to Americanization, but as Tomlinson rightly puts it, it did not really lead to Americanization, not the consumption of television products per se. Now, he points to a myriad of examples of television networks who have managed to dominate their domestic markets and domestic programs generally top the ratings. So, we can give the, I have just given you the example of India and the television networks like ZTV, uh, which gave uh, Star TV a run for its money by, uh, by dominating the Indian market. And it was uh, not the Western content, not the Western American programming, but the domestic programs which generally top the rating. Think of, uh, we can think of the most popular telescope, the, 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 the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law telescopes dominating the Indian television or Hindi film music dominating MTV uh, as an example of how television networks do manage to dominate their domestic markets. Also doubts the concept that cultural agents are passive receivers of information. So, we again come to audience reception theory, which was also mentioned by uh, Mark Booster, which, uh, which shows that unlike in the older theory of media, such as the Frankfurt the uh, School theory, audience are not really passive consumers of cultural products, but exercise their choice. If we go to the new reception theory, they are not passive receivers of information and they use, uh, they inter not only do they interpret cultural uh, content, media content in terms of their own lives, but also appropriate their, this content to their own ends. So, Tomlinson states that the movement between cultural geographic areas always involves translation, mutation, adaptation and the creation of hybridity. So, when, when uh, the movement of culture from uh, say from the global north to the global south to the global uh, say regions like South Asia shows how this culture has been translated, how it has mutated, how it has adapt, been adapted and it has produced hybrid cultures. Not only in terms of programming, think of the programming on MTV India and when MTV India uh, emerged in its new avatar, broke up from um, MTV Asia and emerged as MTV India. Uh, uh, the kind of shows it promoted, the kind of VJs, the kind of uh, compares that it had showed how the entire, uh, con not only the content, but also the format was adapted to the Indian conditions through shows like MTV Bakra, one of the most popular shows in uh, on MTV India, uh, in, in which uh, MTV uh, host would choose a celebrity and uh, play some practical jokes on them using the term, Indian term. Bakra, another show where um, they had uh, regional characters, say a Malayali character or uh, 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 as a host to Indianize, to, to Indianize uh, the, the rock format of MTV, the Americanized format of MTV to suit Indian conditions. Other major critiques are that the term is not defined well and employs further terms that are not defined well and therefore lacks explanatory power that cultural imperialism is hard to measure and the theory of a legacy of colonialism is not always true. The most important thing, the most important point that Tomlinson made was uh, that uh, was uh, you know de uh, deconstructing this myth of impositional myth of cultural imperialism theory, the idea that uh, dominant cultures uh, based largely in the global north are hell bent on 
invading the cultures of the global south and imposing their hegemony, their cultural hegemony on non-western cultures or the cultures of the global south. Uh, if we look at the reality, uh, apart from the, the power, the, the, apart from the concentration of media in the global north and the, uh, the resources that the global north possesses in terms of disseminating its cultural products, there has been no direct imposition of uh, uh, Western, Western cultures or so-called American cultures uh, on non-Western cultures. If we really examine the movement of, say, cultural products like American popular music or American or the Hollywood film, uh, they have not been uh, intentionally imposed on non-Western cultures. Uh, so, the impositional uh, fallacy is uh, exposed by Tom Tomlinson. There is no direct imposition. What has really happened is that uh, American popular culture, American music, Hollywood films have found their ways in a uh, non-Western world because of a certain of the attractiveness uh, they possess for people in other parts of the world. Uh, for their signification of certain cultural values such as freedom, uh, such as uh, individualism, such as uh, even consumption that they, uh, um, they uh, to, to uh, people, particularly youth in the non-Western world or in the global south, they have, they American popular culture does not have to be imposed formally on these non-Western cultures or certain, certain groups within the non-Western world, but they find a following uh, in these parts of the world irrespective of whether they are imposed or not because of the immanent or innate attractiveness they, they possess for certain, certain groups within the non-Western world. So, uh, and usually there is a disjuncture, there is an anomaly uh, between uh, opposition to uh, Americanization uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, or political aspects of uh, Americanization and cultural. So, even the greatest enemies of uh, so called Americanization would be seen not just sporting uh, visible signs of American culture such as blue jeans or Nike sneakers or, but also uh, expressing or indulging in, uh, indulging in uh, pleasures, in the pleasure of listening to American popular music or watching Hollywood fi films. So, this contradiction uh, has uh, been brought out, uh, not been brought out by Tomlinson explicitly. But one can see it very clearly that uh, there is no imposition of dominant cultures over non-dominant -do cultures. The second aspect of the cultural imperialism theory, which uh, um, which Tomlinson does not engage with in detail because he focuses largely on the 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 way uh, viewers in different parts of the world read these messages. The the alien cultural content or the way they interpret these uh, programs or the, the way they use these programs is different from what the uh, producers of those programs or the states in those uh, in, uh, in which those producers are based might want them to use. So, the effects of you know it, it uh, dispels, it disrupts the media effects theories, theory by showing how audience in the global south use cultural content produced by producers in the global north that uh, nullifies the effects of the, the negative effects of media on people in the non-western world. So, the fears about the importance or relevance of 
the lives of American billionaires to starving villages in Australia or India are not are unfounded because uh, the starving villages have more agency than the media effects theory seems to accord to them. Um, so finally, uh, we can say that, uh, yeah, finally the idea that culture, uh, cultural imperialism theory proves to be, uh, uh, proves to be uh, unsuccessful or um, seems to have failed be because of of the flows or the so-called invasion of cultures, of cultures from the global south to the global north, which have which has been in, enabled by the same media and technologies that have led to the dissemination of the flows of uh, Western cultures to the non-Western part of the world. The same media and technologies have been used to catalyze the flows of global uh, cultures of uh, uh, cultures of the global so south to do, to the global north the most visible example of that being bollywood cinema from india thank you